Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's fantastic to see a lot of familiar faces here tonight. I know a few of you have come from the US for this event, so thank you for coming back home for most of you. <clears throat> this is uh, Melbourne Cokeheads number 166. I don't know how we got that far, Rob, but that's a lot of monthly meetups. It's like 15 years? 15 years of meetups, so you're in good company. First up, uh, I'd just like to mention in the spirit of reconciliation, Melbourne Coker Heads acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and the community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. So tonight we've got a fantastic lineup. Um, we're going to get TC up on uh, stage uh, to do a quick uh, welcome, and then we've got a very special video that we'd like to play for you all. Um, after that, we've got James Warren and Cheng Ma giving us a bit of a recap of the WWDC announcements. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will already be familiar with them, but it's always good to sort of recap over them. I did spend a little bit of time uh, before preparing for this, going over the keynote again, and just realising how many announcements there actually were. So it'd be good to just refresh your memory. I'm sure you've, there are a couple that are um, front of mind, but there was actually a lot of content uh, in those presentations that, uh, that we can uh, relive tonight. After that, we're going to have a short break and um, I'm going to conduct a fireside chat. We don't have a fire, but we'll try and um, make it as warm as possible, maybe not as warm as the uh, foyer outside. Um, and we'll get uh, a couple of superstars from the local community up on stage. Matt Hall, Quentin Zeros, and Numa uh, Bereton. As part of the uh, Coker Heads Code of Conduct, um, we want to make this a very uh, inclusive environment. So we've kind of put down some, some guidelines and rules here. If, there are, if you see anything or hear anything that you don't um, think is appropriate or aligned with those values, um, please reach out to somebody with um, one of the Coker Heads badges on their shirt, one of the organisers, or go to the link down the bottom there and, um, and let us know. Just as a little bit of housekeeping, um, the bathrooms uh, out the door and to the right, follow the, the hallway around, and the exit is just basically straight down the escalators um, just over there that you came up. As I mentioned before, the organisers have a little uh, Coker Heads badge on their shirt, so if you need to contact any of us, just reach out. Um, and if you're new or a first-timer to Coker, Coker Heads, uh, we'd encourage you to put a little blue dot which, uh, sticker, which is on the, the table outside, put that on your badge, and that, that way we know you're new here and we can make you feel a lot more welcome. More welcome than usual. In terms of questions, um, we will encourage some questions later on in the fireside chat, but we will hold off questions for other sessions until the breaks. Um, we're not streaming live, so uh, there's no point people posting to Slack. I'm sure they're all wondering what we're doing here tonight, um, but they weren't here, so they're, they're not gonna find out. Maybe a bit later when we publish the video, hopefully. Um, later on, we may have a microphone that we'll pass around that you can ask questions um, into, and that just helps us if we do publish the recording, actually hear the questions that were asked. Um, holding in questions to the end also just helps the flow of the night uh, and normally allows both audiences to participate. Um, there are some Coker Head stickers out the front on the, on the desk if you want to grab one on the way out. Um, I'm a little bit conflicted about this one because I'm the CEO of Itty Bitty Apps and we are also the gold sponsor who I'd like to thank for sponsoring Coker Heads tonight. It's a little bit... Um, it's, it's a little bit recursive, but um, I did buy the, the paper plates and napkins literally today, so I hope you all enjoy those. Um, uh, we couldn't really host these events, particularly not in these kind of venues, without our sponsors. So, look, we've been uh, uh, you know, involved in the community for a number of years and um, really uh, enjoy doing that and supporting everybody and all the new and up-and-coming people who are getting interested in Apple technologies as well. We'd also like to thank Billu for their sponsorship as well. Just a, few, a mention of a few other events that we have going on. We don't just do presentation nights. We have some other events throughout the month. Um, our Hack Night is a fantastic way for you to come along with your side project, maybe get a little bit of help from um, some iOS development experts or Mac um, development experts. Um, but it's also uh, an opportunity to, to meet up with other 
people using other technologies as well, like Android or web and um, back-end technologies as well. That's on the 21st of June. The next drinks night is coming up on the 27th of June. And Rob, I'm not sure where that one is. Is that at or Penny, Blue. Penny Blue? I think there'll be more details on Slack if you want to follow up on that. Meetup's always a great place to go as well. Um, other groups you might be interested in uh, checking out, Sydney Cocoa Heads, if you're up there, go in and pop into their meetups. Um, GDG Melbourne as well is a local group focused on Google, Google technologies. You can find us at melbournecocoaheads.com and also on our Slack, which is where a lot of us hang out. If you've got any questions as well, technical issues or questions you have for us, quite often there's a lot of support there for people. Um, and there's a Macedon um, uh, link there as well. whole bunch of channels in Slack, like I'm sure most of you are aware. Companies you work at, there's a million channels. Uh, for Coca Heads, there's a few important ones, obviously ones centred around the meetups. Volunteers, if you'd like to help out uh, organising an event like this, um, we'd really encourage you to do that. We can make it easy for you and we'll be gentle on you. We, we definitely would love people to come and help um, make these events happen. Also, if you're looking for jobs um, or looking to hire, there's a jobs channel there. And if you would like to do a, a presentation, you can always jump in the speakers channel and, uh, and offer up your ideas for things you might want to talk about. Rob, I think that's it, is it? Time for TC. Yes, this is time for TC. TC, you're up. Do you want to just... Thanks, Sean. Hi, for those that don't know me as yet, my name is TC. I work in Apple Developer Relations. Uh, well, I hope you guys enjoyed WDC 23. It's a pretty special one. Not often we announce a whole new platform. Um, and let there not be any confusion, right? This is not just a VR headset. This is spatial computing. The thing that uh, I dreamt about when I was a little boy long time ago. Okay, so <laughs> tonight is pretty special. We've assembled key members of the industry and contributors um, to, uh, and, and the WDC, I think, that was uh, obviously supported by a lot of great Australian talent. And we have them here tonight. I need to thank Quentin, Numa, and Matt, and the speakers for being here tonight to help kick off our journey and yours taking advantage of the announcements in your apps that we had this year at WWDC. Uh, now, can I please remind you that tonight's content is intended for Apple Developer Program members, and discussion about pre-release software is defined as Apple Confidential as per your membership. If any questions, just ask me, please. Um, now, how many of you know who, who Serenity Coldwell is? And how many miss her daily wrap-ups from WWDC? Yeah, so we thought we'd do something special. That's the last you hear from me on stage tonight. Please come out and talk with me afterwards, but shall we start? Hello, Coco Heads Melbourne. I hope you're all excited for a great evening. Sean and Rob have put together a fantastic program, including a panel with developers Matt Hall, Quentin Zervas, and Numa Burton. I wish I could be there in person to chat about all the great things released at WWDC, but hey, that's what recaps are for, right? So here's a quick rundown. 175 WWDC videos are now available, covering topics like Swift data, widgets coming to more places, and the new watchOS 10 design. And we've got 46 videos about designing and developing for Vision OS and Apple Vision Pro. It's going to be an amazing next few months. So let's kick it off here in Melbourne tonight. Have a great program and hope to chat with you soon.
Alrighty, uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm James. And I'm Dachin. Uh We're both uh, iOS developers at EDBD Apps slash Mantle Group. Uh, and yeah, as Sean mentioned, we're going to be giving a uh, quick uh, highlights reel of uh, what happened to DubDub this year. Um, so there is like a really lot of things that happened this year. Um, so we're going to be barely scratching the surface for a lot of it. Um, we're going to have a whack ton of links we're going to post in a Slack channel afterwards if anyone wants to dig deeper into anything. So to start with, uh, we've got three new Macs. Uh, we've got the new MacBook Air, uh, powered by the M2, uh, now with a 15.3 inch screen. Um, if you like the MacBook Air, there's a bigger one. <laughs> uh, got an update to the Mac Studio. Uh, it's now available with the uh, M2 Max and the new M2 Ultra chip. Uh, mostly a spec bump update, but uh, good to see it getting regular releases. And the much fretted over Mac Pro. Uh, it's available with either the same M2 Max or M2 Ultra, uh, and it also has PCIe slots. Um, so that's for storage expansion, networking, audio interfaces, unfortunately no graphics cards. Uh, we still don't have um, graphics expansion for Apple Silicon yet, maybe one day. Um, so on to what are some of the consumer facing features. Uh, for watchOS, uh, we got a bit of a redesign. Uh, so this includes uh, widgets on the home screen, uh, some improvements to some of the workouts, like uh, the hiking view now supports uh, elevation and pinning last time you got a uh, mobile reception, uh, improving improvements to the cycling workout, and now the Breathe app also supports uh, mental health tracking. Uh, iOS, uh, quite a lot of um, quality of life improvements. Uh, Bump is back, you can now share contacts by just bringing two phones together, uh, custom call wallpapers for when you're calling someone. Uh, the much rumored journaling app was finally shorn off. Uh, autocorrect is now improved and is specifically will learn to swear for you. That's gonna be particularly popular in Australia. Uh, messages got a bit of a redesign. Uh, there's now a new standby mode uh, for when your iPhone is horizontal and charging that's gonna show off some new widgets. Uh, and these are just using the existing widgets that developers have already created, just scaled up a bit. Uh, your phone will also now pick up missed calls and pretend to be your voicemail for you and then give you a live transcription as it's happening. Uh, personally, very excited about this one, given that I get multiple calls a day from people claiming to be the Chinese embassy telling me my visa has expired. Never even set foot in China. Uh, iPad OS, I think a bit of a theme for this one was kind of bringing a lot of features that everyone was waiting for. Uh, so now we've got lock screen widgets and lots of them. Uh, improved PDF markup, uh, the health app has finally come to iPadOS as well, uh, and big improvements to Stage Manager. Um, you can now pretty much freely resize and position windows and they'll stay where you leave them. Um, been trying it out and it's much improved. Uh, macOS Sonoma, a um, bit of a quiet year for kind of Mac first features. Uh, we did get some new video conferencing stuff, so you can now uh, get like a webcam overlay when you're sharing a screen. Uh, and widgets have now been brought to your macOS desktop. Um, so these get these don't even have to be from apps installed on your Mac, it will actually stream the archives from your phone. Uh, they also support the new interactivity uh, based on app intents. Uh, so what's new in Swift? Um, this is some of the more exciting stuff because unlike the new version features where we're potentially years away from getting to use them, uh, we pretty much get to use the Swift stuff day one. Uh, so the big one is going to be Swift macros. Um, these are these now allow you to write Swift code that's going to generate more different Swift other Swift code. Um, they're different to something like the macro support in something like the C pro preprocessor, where it's kind of doing string replacement. Um, these macros run on your fully type checked symbolicated code. Does mean they're a bit more complicated to write, um, but the power of that is that now you get to um, introspect the structure of your code and get to generate things that are fully type checked as you're writing them. Um, because they're just generating regular old Swift code as well, um, there's tools in Xcode um, so that uh, you can see the macros as they're generated, uh, you can step into them with a debugger. And because they're also just generating Swift code, it's also impossible to hide the implementation details um, so this means even if you're using some closed source library, like most of Apple's frameworks, um, you can actually see uh, the code that it's going to generate and how it's actually working. 
Uh, we also get parameter packs for all your functional programming goodness. Um, what these allow is for variadic generics. Um, previously, there was no way to specify a function to take some arbitrary number of generic arguments. You had to have a manual overload for each one of them. So you have to have one for you've one function, one argument, then two, then three, and so on and so on. Um, in addition to just the code duplication this causes, uh, it also means you have to place some arbitrary upper bound on the number of arguments your function can take. This is actually why SwiftUI result builders are limited to 10 views, because that they have to draw the line somewhere, they drew it at 10. Uh, parameter packs, you can now specify just some number of generic arguments and the compiler will just figure it out for you. Um, it's probably going to be something mostly useful for library authors, um, but it's a great addition nonetheless. Uh, Cheng. Thanks, James. Yeah, let's talk about some new features in the new Xcode. Yeah, the first feature it's adding to the new Xcode is uh, it has smarter code completion. Uh, now the Xcode can uh, set you most frequent use code, and it also de detects all the surrounding codes around um, your cursor, and it prompts you the most accurate result. And also it's a very handy feature. Um, uh, remember, we used to use assets for managing the image and the color, um, but we need to use like string for, for matching. Now this has changed. We can use enum for that. The Xcode gonna auto complete for you if you start typing. And also we get a new feature for localization. So if your app supports multi-language, uh, it used to be um, one language uh, in one file, but now that got centralized. Now you get one file, uh, I see in the picture, with all the languages, which become uh, super handy. And also we got a, a real-time documentation preview. So if you have a clause or a struct with documentations, you can just write the documentation and you can preview on the right panel without any delay. Also, as James mentioned, uh, the new Xcode fully support macro, which is um, the new thing, uh, you can expand macro by using the new Xcode, and you also you can set a breakpoint to debug it. Also, uh, we have a new thing uh, called um, preview. The preview is uh, similar to the Swift UI one, but it was powered by the new macro syntax. So it gets shorter syntax, it can preview UIKit and widgets with other enhancements. It also has some small but handy feature like bookmark. You can bookmark your favorite code and you can go back to it later. Also, it has uh, better Git support. So you can just edit your Git commit from Xcode without need to um, uh, go into other um, uh, tools. And also, the it has great enhancements in testing. Uh, it can generate a very uh, nice looking report, I, I like showing the picture. And you can see uh, which uh, task is failing the most and which ones uh, need some kind of a rewriting. And also for UI tests, there's also improvements. Now you can reply your UI, your failing UI test by dragging a progress bar. And you can see what happens uh, when it's failing. This is very handy. Also, OS logging has some native UI support, so if you log stuff with OS logging, it says uh, different background color, and also you can set the, um, the text for it, and you can filter it later. Also has uh, some support like not notarizing, uh, signing, and privacy report. Also, there's a big improvement for Xcode, and you can just distribute your app through Xcloud, Xcode Cloud to the testers, there's a new button in Excel Cloud, so you can just tap it and you, you click it, it will distribute to the test fly and even to the production. Okay, there's some also new features for UI kit. I don't think it's a big year for UI kit and Swift UI because Apple put a lot of effort into the Vision Pro, but we still go through it. Okay, the first big thing is UI kit now works with preview. This is a, a very exciting feature. And as it turned out, uh, UIKit supports preview. Apple didn't uh, do it because uh, Apple wants us to use Swift UI, but now it's uh, all support. As another big feature is uh, there's a new function inside the um, 
uh, view controller's lifecycle is called view is appearing. So why it needs a view is appearing is because it will be at after view will appear, but before view did appear. So this is a place um, if you want to make your view uh, set up ready before view did appear, and within the same transaction with the view will, will appear, you can add it here. Yeah, it's um, this is kind of very uh, a big change in this year. And also you can define your custom traits. So the traits is a thing like you said, like dark and dark mode inside your arcade. And now you can use API to create a, your own traits and you can uh, use it for your own customization. Also, uh, SF symbol got animation support. You can animate a SF symbol and uh, the animation looks uh, uh, pretty fancy. Uh, is that another small update for empty state? So this is an API called UI content on available configuration empty. It's for some pages like you search something but the result is empty or some progressing uh, page. If you have ever have this page, you can worth check, check this API out. Also some small uh, improvements like dynamic line height for different languages. Also you can set locale for UI labels. And this uh, uh, feature in UI page control, like say, uh, like um, in that um, picture, now the you can uh, set progress for UI page control. So if um, you want um, the user to know that it's, it's scrolling, and you want to know the the, the time of the uh, uh, image that will stay on the page, you can use uh, progress. And also a uh, very nice, a small but nice feature is the status bar can adjust itself. The status bar used to be very tricky to set because uh, sometimes your background is dark, some, sometimes it's light. But now if you set it to default, it will just uh, read behind it and adjust itself, which is quite good. Uh, also the UI image supports HDR image. So you can, there's a toggle there, you can set it up and you can display HDR image in your app. Other small enhancements like scrolling view and better test display, uh, displaying and editing. Okay, let's come to the Swift UI. There's some uh, nice feature in this is Swift UI. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, spiritual computing. This is for the uh, Vision Pro. And yeah, I think uh, Swift UI will be the recommended uh, to, to uh, develop any um, Vision Pro app. And there's some new APIs for WatchOS 10. MapKit, charts, table gets brand new enhancements. And you got a new subscri subscription view. So if your app provides uh, in-app purchase, it's worth checking this API out. And also, uh, I'll, I'll cover it later, is there's a new thing called Swift Data. And Swift UI works perfectly with Swift Data. Um, uh, the last thing is, uh, in Swift UI animation, the keyframes is supported. Uh, it's, it used to be very tricky to build any like complex animation like chain animations in Swift UI, but now it supports key, keyframes. So in a picture, you can define different stage of the of your animation, and we will just uh, uh, run it for you. Cool. And there's a new thing called Swift Data. So now when I first saw it, I thought, oh, oh Swift Data is is that core data change the name? No, it's a uh, it's different thing. Swift data is not core data. It's um it's a new framework for persisting data using uh, declarative code. So how declarative it is? It's just uh, uh, use macro for all those things. Uh, for example, if you want to use um, this framework, the first thing you do is just mark your class as model, then you set up a relationship, then you initialize model containers, and you can just use that query or environment to fetch stuff, it's just automatically uh, does for you. And the thing is, this framework is available from iOS 17, so there's no rush to, to migrate. <laughs> okay, so I, have, uh, I hand, hand over to James for talking about the new one more thing. <laughs> One more thing. All right, of course, uh, the Vision Pro headset, that's kind of the big headwinding everyone has heard about this at this point. Um, 
So this is powered, uh, so it's the new VR slash AR headset from Apple, the much rumored one. Um, so this is powered by uh, it's an NM2 processor to run the operating system and all your apps. Uh, and then a special R1 SoC just for doing uh, real-time stuff with all your sensors. And there is a lot of sensors. Uh, the front of the device is just covered in cameras, pointing up, down, um, several LiDAR sensors, IR blasters, um, plus the screen on the front so that people on the outside can see your eyes. Um, it's a VR headset in the sense that it fully encloses your vision and uses screens to uh, completely control what you see. Uh, but it really feels like Apple's pitching this as an AR device first. Like all your experiences start in AR using the cameras to pass through. And that seems to be like a lot of what the demos they were showing off was people using this and running your apps in an AR-like environment. Uh, uses eye tracking and uh, gestures for all your input. Uh, no wands like competing headsets. Um, but all this technology does come at a cost. Um, 3,500 US dollars and God knows how many dollar dues that will end up being. Um, unfortunately, we don't have access to the SDKs yet until later this month, apparently. Um, so the headset can run multiple different kinds of experiences, uh, can run just regular old uh, iPhone and iPad OS apps uh, natively. Uh, can also run special apps written for the headset. Uh, they can be floating 2D windows in your uh, VR environment. Uh, they can have 3D elements as part of these windows, or they can be fully 3D immersive environments. Uh, for building this, uh, you can use UIKit and SwiftUI for building your main UI. For building the more 3D elements, uh, you're going to be using things like RealityKit and ARKit, which have existed for some time. Um, and Apple's also worked closely with Unity um, to allow to use Unity to build fully 3D immersive uh, games and experiences. Uh, it seems like SwiftUI is really what they're pushing for this. Uh, UIKit is supported, but it seems to be mostly as a legacy thing and you really should be using SwiftUI. Um, now, obviously, this price, it's perhaps not going to be a massive consumer hit, but from everyone who's tried it, this is just... It, it seems to be something special. Um, people are describing it as, like, this is the future. And, yeah, personally, I'm very excited to get to try it, hopefully, sometime soon. Um, so just the last quick thing, um, obviously we're all going to watch things like what's new in Swift UI, what's new in UI kit, what's new in Swift, we're all going to watch those main sessions, um, but there's a lot of great sessions that you might otherwise miss, and these are just a handful I think are worth your time. Um, so we've got Discover Observation in Swift UI, which is going over the new at observable uh, macro, uh, and how they've changed how the Swift UI view dipping stuff works. Um, Really great session there, kind of going over how the view builder decides which views to rebuild. Uh, design in Swift UI is kind of a pitch aimed more at designers, saying that they should, they can, and should um, be using Swift UI themselves to build prototypes, um, as opposed to tools like Figma and Sketch. Uh, explore Swift UI animation. Uh, it goes over some of the new APIs, of course, um, but a lot of it is also just going over how animations work in SwiftUI, how it decides which data to animate, how it interpolates between everything, how tra animation transactions work. Um, it's a really good, lots of li little details in there. Uh, analyze hangs with instruments is kind of going through how to use multiple different instruments to analyze some uh, hangs in your app and kind of showing you how to use multiple different instruments together to find issues. Uh, and then last, uh, Demystify SwiftUI Performance is kind of going through kind of some more of the internal details of how SwiftUI uh, updates itself, how it decides which views to rebuild, and kind of lots of little tips on how to uh, increase the performance and find places where you're mistakenly uh, making a view rebuild itself a thousand times a minute. Uh, if you're only going to watch one, um, Demystify SwiftUI is the one to watch. Um, I think that's pretty much it for us. Thank you.
uh, turn down the music and um, I'm not sure if we lost a few people. Maybe they got lost in the bathroom. They'll probably fall back in in a second. Um, okay, so we're going to kick off the next session. This is our fireside chat, WWDC 2023. Rhymes. Um, look, with, you know, I think, as we said there, around about 170-odd sessions to get through. I don't expect anybody here in the room to be an expert on all the announcements from uh, WWDC. Um, if there's a if you have a burning desire to sort of correct somebody or to stick your hand up or to yell something out, just hold it, just hold it back. We'll get you. Um, we'll do some questions at the end, and um, you can tell us all the amazing things you learned from all those sessions. Um, but I'm predicting that some of these guys probably haven't had that much time to get through all the videos yet. <laughs> it hasn't been that long. Um, I know for myself, I think I've done about eight, uh, and that took a little bit of time in between meetings as well. The developer app has a two times. Yeah, I'm doing one and a half. I tried two, and it was a little bit too 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 hard to keep to keep uh, serious. It sounds like chipmunks. So, um, I want to do a, a quick round of introductions. We've got some like absolute superstars of the industry right here in front of you. So, let's make make the most of this uh, time that we have with them. Um, and without the opportunity to to go to WWDC and hang out with your fellow fellow Aussie developers, you know, in the sessions and bars and all that kind of stuff this is the next best thing so make the best use of the time um and like i said we'll have some questions at the end um in front of us we've got uh, matt hall right right here right in front of me uh matt is the co-founder of hipster whale and for those of you who don't know hipster whale um make and publish i would say um crossy road which is a very very popular game if you haven't seen it or heard of it i don't know where you've been probably living under a rock for the last eight years um, an amazing game and an amazing su success story as well. Um, next to him, we've got Quentin. Quentin is the developer, o only developer? You're an indie developer, aren't you? Or are there more in oh, Crunchy Paper? Designer as well. I've got a designer as well. Um, so Quentin's the developer behind um, the Streaks app, which is an amazing app. I I used it for a little bit, Quentin. I probably should have done some... some um, streaks for using streaks because I fell off the horse a little bit <laughs> but what blew me away about that app was just how much of the Apple ecosystem you you lean into you you know anything that Apple comes out with you seem to support it in the next update so it's, it's an amazing app um, Numa um, is the co-founder and CTO of Jigspace for those of you who don't know Jigspace is a platform for um, providing content for the next level of augmented reality presentations. Um, so I'll, I'll just actually, Numa, I, I don't know whether I did that any, any justice, but um, do, do you want to just give us a quick update? We'll work backwards, but if you can just give us a quick update about what Jigspace is and how it came yep. about and maybe how big the team is, where you're located, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you pitched it pretty well. Uh, it's uh, Jigspace is a platform for creating 3D presentations. So we think of it kind of like... PowerPoint for 3D, Keynote, sorry, for 3D. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's like we made it really simple and we just uh, let people import their 3D files and then make a bunch of steps like you would do in a, in a 2D presentations. And we do the animations for you and you, you get a bunch of options to make the presentation look really nice. And then you can share it with a, with a link. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what we do. Uh, we started in... 2015 uh, and it was uh, we were like me and my co-founder uh, Zach <coughs> were teaching uh, game development in a college in Melbourne and uh, we uh, we had a lot of remote students that were struggling to engage with their classmates and with the course content uh, from just studying by themselves uh, at home and it was the the very early days of the the VR hype uh so the dk1 the, the the oculus uh the first kit was out so we tried internally uh at the school we tried uh prototyping what was uh, a like an education a 3d virtual educa education platform where uh, we would send the the kids to the students and they could log in and we made like this really cool world where you could see it like it was it looked like ancient greece you had like a a theater where you could sit on butterflies and beautiful clouds and you could they could just log in and connect and just hang out with their little colorful avatars and, and, and have this sense of community. Uh, but then we had this really beautiful place, everything 3D, full control of our everything we we did in that world, but still the course content that we were, we were giving the students were 
PDFs and, and PowerPoints. And so they were viewing in, in this 3D VR world, they were viewing the content on a little uh, virtual iPad. So um, we, we saw the, the problem there and we started just coming up with a way to create that content in 3D. So there was nothing really easy and really like cross-platform to create 3D educational content. So that's that was the start of, um, that's how Jigspace got started. And at the start we thought it was course content and we were thinking uh, IKEA instructions as well. Like if you've seen the IKEA instructions, the, the horrible little drawings no one understands. Uh, we thought like if you could see this thing in 3D step by step and just go to next, next and see the little table get together, the little screw come in, it would be a really good tool for everyone to have. So yeah, we started building this and then Vision Pro. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, one, one interesting thing about you guys, and I knew this for quite a while, um, you've had coverage from Apple before, I think, in previous WWDCs, is uh, that correct? Yeah, we, uh, maybe not in WWDC, uh, we were in the, um, for the uh, the launch of the LiDAR, the iPhone 12 Pro. Right. Yeah, we, we did something, uh, it was really good, because that was like a little bit, so that was 2020. Um, uh, and we did something there to use LiDAR to allow people. So at that point, we, we, s we worked a little bit less with education and more with enterprise people. And we used the LiDAR to let people scan uh, an empty room or uh, like a facility floor and just like scan the walls and bring that scan as a 3D model and then make a presentation about uh, the layout for the, uh, the floor, so where all the machines are going to go. Because this is all stuff that's like, it's really hard and expensive to test. They can't bring the machines, realize it doesn't fit, and send them back. And So, with so it's not like placing an IKEA chair in the corner. Yeah, it's no, actually yeah. a big piece of equipment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the IKEA is the easy version of this. Yeah. This, uh, So yeah, it was it was yeah, super helpful. And like LiDAR just came perfectly timed and for... And you guys were using AR kit, if I'm not wrong, and reality kit from very early on? Uh, reality kit, a little bit... But not really. Uh, AR kit. We started. We actually launched our uh, our first like AR app, AR version of Jigspace with the launch of AR kit uh, in 2017. Right. Uh, yeah, we were. We uh, initially I didn't want to do AR at all because it was at that time like VR was kind of cooler and AR was really shit. It was you just had like a little QR code that you could scan and it wasn't wasn't great. And so we were already supporting, we had a web version of Jigspace, we had an Android version of Jigspace, we had a HoloLens version, and then we uh, we were a small startup of just two people. Um, and so when uh, Zach told me, like, oh, Apple really something, it's ARKit, we should try it. I was like, nah, don't want another platform to support. And in the end, we ended up just like giving, giving it a, a go like really quickly, and it was super easy to make. Uh, and yeah, so we, we made that, and it was we're just blown away by the the possibilities. So, so I think the fact that Apple were developing those frameworks so openly, everybody, I mean, it was the biggest, you know, worst kept secret, right, that the glasses were coming. It was just a matter of when. I think we were all expecting them maybe last year, or if it wasn't this year, it was going to be next year. And um, so you, you and the team are really well placed to capitalize on everything that's been announced at the moment, right? Yeah, well, we've tried very hard to predict what the hell ha Apple was going to do. Uh, so yeah, we we would try to like watch like the all the keynotes. <laughs> Good job. <and> <laughs> yeah, 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 that was that was really what we've been building for really from the start. Like we we were thinking, okay, like for now you have like, and people were telling us like, oh, how can I build my table if I'm holding my phone to to view the AR? Yeah, concept. the experience wasn't amazing. Yeah, it was it was like not 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 the best, but we knew that at some point the like the software and the the performance and the hardware will all converge and at one point someone probably apple we're gonna make s like an amazing device that would just go mainstream and that would allow us to do this this uh this 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 ar experience properly yeah so yeah no, we've just got a helmet oh with a camera <laughs> over the front <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. hands free yeah that would have been perfect actually we might, we might move on for that just quickly we will come back to the vision pro i think it's probably one of the most interesting topics that, that we're going to talk about tonight Quentin, um, Streaks, um, an amazing app. Like I said, it's it supports watch OS, iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS. Is there any OS it doesn't support? We have a workout version on the Apple TV, so no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's on all the it's on all the Apple platforms. Um, and I think that's just an amazing um, credit to you, but also for Apple to pick up on uh, you know a small independent you know development house that 
is all in on, on a- what Apple's doing. And like I said, you do seem to adopt the new things reasonably quickly. Um, I don't know whether it's kind of like the type of app that it is. And basically, do you, do you want to explain a little bit about how Streaks came about and what it is? Yeah, I think, I mean, to that point, the nature of the app, just before I answer the second part, um, it's a habit forming app where you can basically put in any task that you want to get better at. And so because of that, you can put in anything and therefore any framework or feature really does apply. So probably the best integration within the app is the health integration because that tracks what you're doing automatically. And so that's a, yeah, that's that's probably like the the, the first class um, integration. So anytime a new health um, feature was added, um, that would be sort of the first thing that would get added um, year to year. Like if there was a new, I don't know, workout type or something. Um, you know, there were ones for like uh, hearing tests and so all of those things get added every year. So that 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 allows the person to add a task that reminds them to do that. So so using that example, we don't actually do the hearing test in the app, but if you using if you're using another app to do that, it will um you know, it'll keep track of that. So so all the things like um all the sensors that the Apple Watch has that um allows you to track when you're doing your steps, all that kind of stuff. So, so one one of my goals was I've got a sit stand desk spend a lot of money on it but don't use it. I don't know if anybody else has got that kind of problem at home where, yeah, okay, Rob. <laughs> um, and one of my goals was to stand more at my desk and I set a, a, a streaks goal to do that, maybe however many, you know, hit my stand yeah. goal yep. a certain number of times a week and it's quite configurable so you can say, I don't care about weekends because I'm not at my desk or whatever. Um, but it was somewhat... I don't want to use the word magical, but the way it kind of integrated was really, really cool because these things that the phone was doing would automatically feed into my goals. Yeah. And and the, there's a reminder system within the app, so it learns when you do the, the task and it will sort of prompt you ahead of when you should do it just to get you in the mindset of, hey, you, I'm going to ask you to stand up now, so <laughs> get ready for it, Sean. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's sort of been the key. And, and it's sort of like it sort of feeds on itself where – on the sort of main screen, you can only see six tasks. So if you've done five of them, the sixth one might be completely unrelated, but the fact that you've done five makes you want to do that sixth one. So it's, I mean, gamification, it, in essence, it's a form of gamification. I don't really use that term, but that's in essence what it does, and that does work. So. Yeah. And you won an Apple Developer Award, was it 20, when was it? You should know. Yeah, I 2016? Do know. <laughs> 26, <laughs> 2016, yes. Um, yeah, so... Um, the app came out in 2015, and to answer your earlier question, it, it came about because Swift was announced in 2014, and I really like doing square brackets and all of that, but I thought I should probably learn Swift because, you know, a new language isn't being announced unless it's actually... You know, it's, not, it's not a small thing to announce a whole new like way of building apps. We can see the fruits of that now with SwiftUI and Vision Pro, and like it all, it's all been a long path to get to that point, but I figured I should probably learn this language at some point, and... Um, being an indie developer and having a small business is a bunch of just repetitive crap you have to do every single day. Um, and I was using it in, I was going to say Notepad, like you know you said with uh, PowerPoint, but no, in Notes. Um, I was just like marking down in a text file. I thought this is kind of boring. I know how to make apps and I want to learn Swift, so why don't I just sort of like whip something up? And that's how it sort of came about. And like the the concept of doing something every day to you know form a habit or you know, to entrench that behavior isn't like one that we invented, but it wasn't really on the App Store at the time. So I guess we kind of hit a, I wouldn't say we invented the category, but we were very, very, very early in that category. And there are, say, of, there, there are a lot of them now. So are there a lot now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, fortunate timing, I guess. Um, just quickly, one of the things that you were highlighted for in the keynote was, um, you know, the interactive widgets mm-hmm. and things like that. So yep. it was funny. So one of my takeaways from the keynote um, aside from the Vision Pro uh, device and, and Vision OS was it did seem like a lot of uh, quality of life improvements. So there was a crap ton of them, like just things that honestly I looked at yeah. and thought, I thought it did that already. <laughs> so interactive widgets was kind of like one of them. Maybe I don't nah, use the system. It was the, system it was the old, t- what they called today extensions. They were interactive. That was the way you sort of swiped to the leftmost screen and you could add little doodackies, not widgets, today extensions. Uh, you can interact with those. So... That was actually a um, bit of a feature downgrade when I removed that. I had a lot of annoyed users because I had a fully interactive one on there. And at a certain point, it just got too hard to maintain with the new widget system. So removed that about a year and a half ago. So 
you might have been thinking of that. But yeah, that's right, okay. one of them. <laughs> yeah, quality, I think quality of life is a good way of looking at this year because it's from, from like that's one example, but even just some of the developer tools that, that were outlined in the earlier talk. Um, yeah, just a lot of nice little things that just make developing a little bit well, better. So quality of life for users, but for users quality of life for developers, developers as yeah. well. So, um, yeah. And the you were also highlighted for the full screen watch app. Um, was that really just a redesign of your existing watch app? I know you had a blog um, post on the swapping it to Swift UI, but... So, yeah, so the idea behind that is it's basically just a new design language for the Apple Watch. Um, so yes, we released an update to the app to use Swift UI on the Apple Watch um, earlier. I don't even know what, what is this year anyway. Um, I don't know. Like March or something? Yeah, I know. I just forget. Um, in about March or so, but this is basically a new design language where I guess, I guess a way of looking at it is I think one of the slides showed it there or the video I think from Serenity that showed the, the new grid where it's got like a circle um, and then the corner. I mean, it kind of looks like the, I don't know what the names of the watch faces are, the one with the clock in the middle and the corner complications. Yeah, it's yeah, kinda it looks very familiar. That grid it? looks like that. Yep. And I think there's a couple of other designs where it's um, a similar layout but with corner. Yeah, there's, a f there's like two or three designs but... I guess my big takeaway with that is it's full color backgrounds. Where in the past the, d the advice was use black backgrounds, it saves battery, it blends with the bezels on the device. But now it's like we've got big batteries, they go edge to edge, so make them look as nice right. as you can, okay. kind of thing. So yeah. that's I think the underlying thing is evolution the, of what yeah, was there? full color background, highlight the content, that kind of thing. And um, can I ask, aside from just being awesome and having an awesome app, what would you encourage people here? I mean, is it basically just be a great developer, have a great app. Is that is that what gets you noticed, or is it? I think it's sound advice, just generally, like. Just yeah, okay. but uh, I don't <laughs> know. It's like one of those things. Don't make a bad. No, <laughs> but no. like, this isn't anything about money. Like, obviously, what we're talking about. But the the old advice when you're making money is focus on the thing, and the money will come. Don't focus on the money because then it won't. So the same advice, like uh, again, not talking about money, but just this, the principle of focus on making the good app and implementing the features and. I guess scratching your own itch like don't focus on what like results and um, you know like if, what's the word not glamour you know, you know like the accolades and stuff don't focus sure, on yeah, stuff because yeah. you, won't, you won't reach it just I really want an ADA but I don't know how to get there so maybe I'll just focus on making a great app and see if it happens <laughs> <laughs> I don't know like it's um, it's it, it can be a, it's a right place right time as much as anything like you, but um, yeah, at the end of the day you have to make something that if I can interject there it's also about making the device itself look good yep I was just going to say and I'm, I'm pretty sure TC won't mind me saying but obviously like I said about streaks you do use a lot of the capabilities of the platform and you adopt them quite quickly so I think one thing that that could help people is to understand that Apple really wants to, you know, showcase amazing apps that are using all the capabilities of the device. One thing I always find frustrating is a lot of clients come to us, I work for an app development consulting company, and their ideas and their concepts for what you can do with the devices are very much 10 years ago or, or you know, a scrolling list of search results kind of thing instead of thinking about things like live activities and and ways that you can engage the user outside of the the little app that you tap on and goes full screen. So if you can think about ways to extend yourself or convince the people that you're working with to, to explore those things, that might be worthwhile. But look, obviously the constraints of um, device and iOS version support can limit that as well. But it, it, it's hard, in, like a company that's coming to you to do that, they don't really know the intricacies of like, what's an app intent? How does that work? But if you follow down the path of using the intent system a few years ago, which like no company is going to come to you and say, make shortcuts work with us, right? Like, because that costs a lot of money and there's no benefit to them probably, like that they can see. But then, so we've done it with streaks and we've had support for that for as long as shortcuts have been out. And now app intents is out. So we've adopted that system. It's not out yet, but we've adopted it. It's coming. Um, and that now sets us up well to do the interactive widgets because that all uses app intents and buttons in the uh, live activities that all uses app intents. So just having that sort of thing that customers don't understand or or wouldn't be willing to pay for, just that's sort of how you get to that point. Yep. Um, yep. So okay. yeah, that's, that's hard. They're not going to want to do that stuff because that's not what they see f front and yeah, centre. Yeah. But I mean, look, but the apps are going more and more to not the actual app experience, but all the OS level stuff and. You can see that with how 
the iOS widgets will appear on your Mac desktop. Like that's all enabled by that system. Yeah, that's as a an good example. point, actually. Yeah, Matt, Crossy. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, mate. Yes. I, know, I know you've been sitting there patiently. Um, Crossy Road and game development. Um, we were kind of talking a little bit about what what the Vision Pro means for you and how you, you yeah. you're going to have to get your head around all the opportunities that opens up. Tell mm. us a little bit about your company though and about the history and then maybe a little bit about your thoughts on the the you know the vision pro device and building yep. games for it sure yeah i'll go slightly broader than my than hipster whale because my you know i'm f- i'm 48 now but i started programming when i was like seven so i've been making games for like 41 years old 41 years and then um i my sort of i started on the app store not long after the the uh, iphone started I was I I had been making games and I went independent. I was thought, well, God, people seem to be making games in their bedroom again. It was, it was all studio system, so I decided to break out and and start to work on a, a app for Big Fish Games. And while I was working on that, the iPhone appeared. I was like, I'd worked on mobile before, and I was like, well, t- it's probably just another mobile device. There was like a thousand that year from Nokia. Like, okay, there's. 1001 now i remember going to the conference to show off my game that i developed i was in the back of the theater sort of similar to this one watching people talk and like every second person in the audience had an iphone and i was like i think something's happening here so i i very quickly pivoted to that and then in that was sort of 2008 2009 just as the global financial crisis hit so i found myself as an independent developer in exactly the right place at the right time while all the studios were closing and so, yeah, with that was the company with them was called ClickTok. So I released um, Little Things and then Doodle Find and then Little Things Forever. So I'd actually had three number one app store hits before Crossy Road came along and obviously had a few more number one since then. Crossy Road, of course, was much more popular than anything I'd done to date. That was like number one times a zillion. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was really great and sort of that experience like slowly building myself up and slowly building a reputation with Apple and sort of slowly understanding what makes a really good app. Yeah, sort of eventually put me in the right place at the right time. Yeah, It's funny that I do kind of keep trying to tell people and even just coming to these events I, I tell a lot of people that join our business that um, networking is a little bit like compound interest like you don't see the return straight away mm, but just totally. being here being present meeting other people you know you find job opportunities even like you kind of chip, fir- chipping away first conference i went to i met like someone who was eventually going to be my amazon rep and someone else who now runs bug snag like just all these people there was a lot of people there who'd already made it and they won't talk to you like, uh, you know, oh, w- what do you do? Well, uh, nothing. Okay, great. I'll be over here <laughs> talking to the important people. But you, like anyone you meet at conferences and things like that, you never know who's going to be the next big thing. And that person you spoke to a bit loosely that time is now <laughs> really a hundred times more like, successful yeah, than a, you. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. I think I met it's Quentin at a so WWDC. Often. I met Mark Edwards, one of the early ones. Where are you, Mark? There you go. Drag me off. We... I don't know. And actually, I think that was at a um, TC sponsored event back in the day. The the or AUC, sorry, um, might have been. And also there were drinks as well. So um, great opportunities to meet people. Yeah. And I mean, would you say that was influ- yep. influential? People in where, on the way down. <laughs> 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 and and so when when you look at the Vision Pro device yeah. and the kind of apps that you're making. You mentioned that actually that, I mean, Crossy Road is probably the one that you're most famous yep. for, but there are other games that you built more recently that have been focused on virtual reality. Yeah, so um, uh, Mighty Games, which is was kind of like, um, they've recently been purchased by Keywords, but that was sort of like our sister studio. So they did a lot of the development on Disney Crossy Road, for example, like l- most of the programming. Like Hipsterware was so small, like for Pac-Man 256 and for Disney Crossy Road, we sort of worked with people we've we've known forever to help expand the studio without having to scale crazily. Um, so yeah, I worked with with Mighty Games on Shooty Skies Overdrive, which was released it was a COVID game. So yeah, it came out late 2020, and um, for just for the quest. But of course, the whole time we were working on that, we're going. Apple's surely got something in the bag. I think, you know, just properly understanding what VR is or at the time, that's 
fully interactive yep. as in you know it, you're in a, you're in a room there's nothing there's no notion of what's around so you so shooting skies is one where there's things coming at you you've yeah. got two controllers you're shooting stuff out of the sky and you it's a, like a fully like a shooting f- gallery yeah that's right environment but yeah. yeah but there's like because we're a mobile developer we knew how to optimize you know the que- the quest is a mobile device so we knew how to optimize for 10,000 bullets on the screen at once and you're literally trying to, to dodge around them. So we were trying to push the envelope with regard to design but still just trying to imagine, I wonder what Apple's thing is going to be. How is this game going to work if they eventually release AR and what is what is their AR? So Crossy Road itself and Crossy Road Castle, we hadn't brought them to Quest because we were like, I don't see how Crossy Road could possibly make a fun not even not like experience. a tabletop game, kind of s- looking at it from a 3D perspective. Well, certainly not first person and <laughs> jumping through traffic. <laughs> like, it's not, yeah, we, we played with that and it's, I can, it's not fun at all. <laughs> it's uh, extremely scary. But, but I mean, even like looking down at the at the Crossy Road kind of scene, but, at, at, you yeah, know, like that and look at your chicken. But the notion the of road. like with Crossy Road, it's like a really long column. You'd be staring off into, into good, space, yeah, right? Point, so, yeah. but But the... I was really interested to see what Apple came up with and the notion of there's there's basically four ways of doing it. You have a window in front of you that's square. Like it could be 3D, you can see into it. You have a volume, which takes up a space. You have an experience, which is basically taking into account the room around you. Like, you know, the demo where you could draw flowers on the wall. For example, in Shooty Skies Overdrive, we could have, we sort of know the space you're in and you could have ships, you know, flying out of that speaker over there and across here and into there or out of the floor. And then finally, the fully inter- the fully immersive experiences as we've seen on Quest for the last few years. So, so one of the things I found amazing at that, um, at the, in the WWC keynote was just how many scenarios and modalities that Apple have considered and that the, you know, the, the sort of 2D screen in space, the, the volume yeah. and the immersive space, they all seem really well thought out and obvious. And I know that that's a really tricky thing to do because what seems obvious now is obviously took years and years of it, you know, yeah. practice and trial and error to see what, what would actually work. I'll have a small dig at Meta, Oculus, Facebook, call them what you will that company that they they never really pushed our operating system i was sort of waiting for them to well, what are you going to do like the the when i had the the quest on early and they had pass through like the very first have, have you used it with pass through where it's i've black. used the pass through version no. so they basically there's a camera that they just it just happened to be a byproduct they had cameras on this on the thing to figure out tracking and then someone went you know what i wonder if we can put this into the feed and and then so the first time I saw that, I was like, whoa, okay, they're really onto something. I was actually able to walk down the stairs with, with someone headset dangerously on. with a headset on. And I was like, well, that worked. And I was like, mm, this is going to be really interesting. But they took so long to actually get to that point. And, of course, one week before the Apple conference, they announced their now pass through as color and the cameras are right under your eyes where they should be so you get perspective correct. Like, I think they, right. they've squandered their Absolutely. huge lead. Yep. And they just never really did anything in the operating system. They have a screen in front of you that sort of moves where you are. But then, but why? Well, like well virtual uh, desktop was really popular, right? Yeah, it was interesting actually yeah. that that Apple's approach, you know, wasn't to recreate the the metaverse. It's not like no. you're projecting yourself into another universe. It's actually your present in the real yeah, world. Yeah, that might have held. <laughs> might have held back. with all these Absolutely, other yeah. things to do. Um, and uh, yeah, the, just the amount of technology and the the coordination. I mean, we've got some pretty big projects going on at the moment with lots of teams, and most of you who work with big companies will know how hard it is and how complex it is to get these things, like a banking app, out the door. Um, just think about all the people involved in this project that were not only reliant on other teams to get their stuff done, but hardware and and production and just a whole lot of other. Concerns that would have mul- you know that the matrix of of <laughs> factors in developing a product like this are just amazing, and they, Apple really seem to have just nailed it as much as they can on this first attempt. And and so Numa, like when I look at this, I think about the 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 original iPod or the iPhone when it first came out. Um, you know, this is a first gen product. 
what, you know, some of the people I've spoken to are, are excited, not necessarily by what they can do today at the mm. $3,500 price point, but what do you kind of see, you know, like in terms of like jig space and, and like the future for the technology? Are you as excited or do you think it's like here now or do you think it's going to be 10 years before this is really something that, that we can get more excited about? No, it, it's great now. It works. It's it's perfect. Sorry, yeah, I should um, I should have asked. Has anybody in this room actually used a Vision Pro device? One. Okay. Yeah. So, tell us. <laughs> uh, sh- <laughs> it's uh, everything you've seen in the keynote is real. Uh, yeah, it just it's as like magical as they described it in the video. When we uh, when we tried it for the first time, it was. Uh, yeah, everyone and like in the team, like a lot of us have, we've played with a bunch of VR headsets and we've tried all of them. Uh, and this was just uh, the whole new, whole new world. Well, it's the first one with the, an actual pass through that works and that's like high resolution and everything. And like you were saying, cl- going down the stairs wearing the headset and you, you forget that you are wearing it and that peop- you can see people and people can see you. Like there's always with wearing a VR headset, you always like. Stumbling around the room and just like you j- trying to look down the, the gap between watching. the thing and the yeah, find yeah, your keys, just keyboard or whatever. Yeah. No, it's just uh, it's perfect. So like the pass through is, it's perfect. You just you just see everything. Like we could, I could have the headset on and write code, like read code on my screen through the pass through. That was the question I wanted to know because in the keynote, the any text they had on the screen was really big, and I went, "Can you really?" Code yeah. with this. That was the first thing I was going to do. Put it on and sit in front of my yeah, Mac. You can yeah, you can. Just like reading through the pass through, you you can, but also like with the that feature of casting your Mac screen as a virtual, like all the virtual content is even sharper than the. Well, it's like it's incredibly. And is that because crisp. of the foveation? They can kind of focus all the rendering energy on where you're looking. Yeah, if you if you do little tricks with your eyes, you can see that uh, <laughs> the blurry the blurry bits. Yeah, like like on the side, it's it's a little bit blurry, but you never notice unless you're trying to trick so it. So one question I had for you, I don't know whether did you actually try the the screen casting off the Mac at all? Uh, no, oh, okay. I haven't. Yeah. So they they mention trackpad and and keyboard a lot. They don't talk about mouse at all. Um, obviously, the mouse would have to work with the projection of the Mac OS screen, but yeah. and so that's fair enough. Maybe the the mouse is bounded by that window, but with the trackpad, I do wonder: do you then like how does it blend from the environment into that screen? I haven't I haven't tried the any input devices. I we just used the hands, and yep. it was it was and perfect. And I, I, yeah, tracking was good, perfect. Like the precision of it is just insane. Yeah, you just we spent maybe like the the first half hour just playing with the the device settings, where you had a couple sliders and toggles, and we just grab the slider and just move it a tiny bit, and it would move exactly. Like it, it's incredibly precise. Like mm-hmm. more than a mouse, I think. So, so the the combination of hardware and software right now, functionality wise, might be spot on. But obviously, the the heft of the device and the ergonomics have only got to improve over time, right? And and that's, I guess, what I'm saying is, you know, the original iPod was a chunky little beast. You know, it only had this much yeah, capacity. Yeah. You know, Apple's the master of you know chip design and consolidation so you can only expect that over time this thing's going to get more compact and from, and from a ui ux point of view i think we're at swipe to unlock level like there's just so many more things you could do so with it with yeah yeah i think people are going to come up with new new interactions and new things like the i i suspect that the mouse might be a, a bit weird because like you're moving on this plane and you're watching like well that's what happens right now unless you got your monitor yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but then you have the depth as well that you don't have, so like yeah. I don't know how you jump. Well, they, they do support the, the trackpad, so I just thought that was an interesting combination of you know input devices. But um, Quentin, what what are your thoughts on it, mate? Like, are you going to get one? Yes, I'd like to try one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I guess my fear with that kind of thing is how quickly is the next one going to come out after it? <laughs> so you know. With the Apple Watch, I'd, I've bought every single Apple Watch there is, but that's not a, you know, five and a half thousand, whatever it would be in Australian dollars. But that, <laughs> that's a great example, right? Because I bought the Gen 1 watch as yeah. well. And look, for somebody that hadn't worn watches for a number and a number of years and now understanding the watch market, it's actually not badly priced for, you know, yeah. compared to a mechanical watch. But 
no one really thinks about upgrading their most normal people don't think about upgrading their watch every year no, no. most normal but doesn't include you in it's the audience it, well it's hard as a developer <laughs> because people will have the latest iPhone and I'll have a series 4 watch well, and, so and, you've and then you can't update you've got to have the latest stuff Quinn obviously <laughs> yeah, no. that's how I justify no, it's it as just well. as a, it's hard to support and deprecate old versions because of that because people don't upgrade their watches at the right. same rate as yes. I, I do yep. but, um, yeah got it um, definitely keen to like try out a couple of ideas um, at least when the simulator comes out soon Um it's one of those things until you sort of like try it out and like code a few ideas or play around with the actual device. I don't know. I I, I think like like Numa said, he's used it. For the rest of us that haven't, I guess there's this expectation that your mind will be a little bit blown and it'll sort of um, no going back. Uh, yeah, not that. Just you 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 think of <laughs> I ideas. I don't want to use the monitor ever again. Not that, but you'll think of app ideas where you're like, oh, I didn't actually Mac. considered that, and maybe. Like maybe streaks will work really well as some kind of 3D immersive experience. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But um, it's definitely something I'll be exploring. Well, it's, it's interesting that you can have so many different types of apps in the same... Yeah. Uh, ...provided by the same device. You're fully immersive, 2D screen, somewhat blended. Yeah, and just placing 3D. them around the room. So when you go... S- like when you look that way, one app's there. And when you look that way, another app's there. Like yeah. I, I think it's going to change the way people certainly use their computers. Even just from a, like ignoring all the like entertainment side of things or social side or share play whatever um just the how you manage how you're using it in place of your computer i think it's going to change the way i think the the eye tracking to me was uh you know just didn't i don't know just blew me away how obvious that seems i just want to look at the thing and then go like this and it's going to select it um i think one thing you, you sort of notice and maybe i haven't used a lot of i think i used one of the really early oculus um, but haven't used anything since is the fact that they've got talks in the in the dub dub videos about um, there's there's one that talks about fatigue like I I can't imagine Meta have or maybe they have produced content about worrying about users fatigue and that so the fact that it's being designed from the point of view of don't make your users tired or think about exe- like it's designed from ex- accessibility first I think that has put it on a good stead with um, being a device that people can actually use for long periods of time and people want to use. So yeah. so when you see things like that, it's yeah, kind of exciting. So just quickly before we, uh, I think we probably need to throw the questions because you're probably all dying to ask a couple. Um, aside from the Vision Pro device, uh, what announcements kind of got you excited at WWDC? Were there any other announcements that kind of got you thinking that's, the, that's great? The game, the game mode, like a Mac sort of a bit under-supported with regard to games it has been for a while, whether it's, you know, just... Apple don't really But Apple's like always doing that, stuff that, with this games. Was, but this was the most games focused, as in certainly traditional fo- games focused one I've seen for a while. Like it sort of started with the when now we properly support controllers, okay. Like you can you can play these games with controllers. And then after the M one Mac, which had a pretty weak video card, it was like now this one's got twice, you know. Yeah, they they suddenly became very viable for playing games. And now game mode and the game porting toolkit. I thought this was probably the most games first, like game like game supporting WWDC I've seen for a long time. It'd be interesting to see whether the games. I mean, you probably know more about the games industry than me, given you've been in it for a while. But you know, will they look at the Mac market and go, "Yeah, we're going to take the time and energy to, to port the games"? So to that it, it's about the time and the energy, and they've just r- massively reduced the time the and energy required with the game porting kit, like. I saw a video of someone who was, you know, Diablo 4 is, r- <laughs> I'm sure everyone is aware, is not supported on Mac. And it's thanks Whoopi Goldberg for, r- you know, putting, <laughs> for standing up for the little guy. Um, but there was, you can you can play Diablo 4 on the Mac right now with the game porting toolkit. Like, that's absolutely amazing. Like, I remember being quite stunned with Rosetta the first time I saw it. I was like, how on earth did they do this? And then this Rosetta, but for DX12 is like... <laughs> Another level just again. Opened it's up amazing. The whole world. Yeah. Right. Quentin? Uh, like I said before, just a lot of little quality of life things for f- both for users and for developers. Like for users, it's um, just, just doing more with like live activities and intents and uh, widgets and all all that kind of stuff. So yeah. Yeah, just other ways to access your app in a timely way. So, two things for me. One was um, airdrop will work when you're not connect like on big file transfers when you. Go away oh from yeah, the device because it always like time, I, yeah. I have to like transfer five photos at a time because if I do like ten, it just dies. Um, anyway, so that's a game changer for me. <laughs> the other one was um, standby. 
the the kind of yeah, bedside yeah. clock. Yeah, which is think? essentially widgets, and I think live activities work in there as well. I, um, yeah, like I'll actually use my phone near the bed. We immediately clock, jumped clock on radio. and looked for a stand. It's yeah. like I need the right. I need the st- <laughs> what sort of stand did they have that? I need that one. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You get the snooze button um, accessory later. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Bluetooth or something. Or yeah. As long as the snooze stops being that tiny button down the bottom, I can barely read you while I'm asleep. N- N- um, I was mostly just waiting for the Vision Pro stuff, but uh, <laughs> it's cannot I wait. Almost, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't even remember any of the, <laughs> the start of the keynote. <laughs> I, all the rest yeah, was a blur. Can, can, <laughs> I make, can I make a, c- a small confession? Um, I might have had a sense that I had something appearing in the in the watch segment, so I went to the bathroom right after that and missed the one more thing. Like, no. <laughs> Sorry, never mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, I think with that, we might throw to the audience if you've got a few questions. Uh, Pat, do you want to run around with my mic? And uh, maybe I'll share mine with Matt if anybody wants to ask me any questions. I probably don't. Um, G'day. Just a quick question about the Vision Pro. How long can you actually wear it for? Like, how heavy is it? Can you wear it for, like you said, half an hour? How long did you get to play with it? Uh, multiple hours at a time, yeah. It's, I don't know, like you, if you're working, like doing something intense, because I was like reading code and things uh, and testing a lot of things, I was like taking it on and off a lot. But yeah, you can you can wear it for uh, hours and it's fine. The, the best thing is it doesn't, it doesn't heat up like the other headsets because the battery's outside. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty fine. It, it when you take it off, like it's kind of like when you get out of a movie room, like you, you need to like readjust a tiny bit, but it's there's nothing, it's not too uh, disturbing, like not as bad as other headset where like a fully enclosed like VR headset. When you take it off, you're like whoa, but no, no, because of the pass through, like you you for you forget that you are wearing it. Hey, no surprise. I have a question. Um. Probably more directed at Numa, but happy to hear what the others have to say. Taking a 2D um, app, AR content, and then translating it into a sort of volumetric spatial computing realm, what's sort of your experience of the process there? Any immediate gotchas that people might um, be curious about, stuff like that? I guess uh depends like if you just want to like convert your app so it works in space you you barely have anything to do if you just want to have like your flat window but in space that's all supported almost natively it's the same swift ui it's the same everything so i'm i'm pretty sure it would run almost immediately but then if you want to really like take advantage of the new platform then you you almost have to like Starts from scratch because you want to use, you want to like create new interactions, a new way to show your content. You want to take advantage of having a whole room instead of a little rectangle. So you can, you could, you could uh, start from scratch. You could make your own interactions and everything, like the the hand motions. You can, you can, like have something really like traditional, like work with just looking at and and pinching, and have your uh, your usual like motions and 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 clicks, but yeah, if you want to, that's there's like a whole a whole new world to explore. If you want to, you're designing for a room and not for a, a screen. So there's a lot of stuff you can do. You have to take into account that, like, you don't want people to like reach out to like touch things or like raise their hands too much. Like, there's a lot of cool hand motions you can do. But if people are gonna use your app a lot, like, we we spent a bunch of time trying to figure out how we would do like swiping between the the different steps of the our presentations, and in the end, like we. We were doing this, but then if you want to swipe fast, then you're doing this, and it's kind of like it's not nice. And if you have like 45 slides, you don't want to be doing this all the time. So in the end, like the easiest was just to have like a, a big, a big nice button to go next, where you could just like really quickly with your eyes. You, it's it's quicker than the mouse. Like you don't have to travel, aim, and then and then click. You just you get instantly. You look at the thing, you click, it's gone. So it's it, we we ended up like doing something really like like basic but that worked but yeah there's all those new considerations that you have to take into account but that's actually a great example of um 
you know, like with a mouse, you kind of have to travel from there to there. But with sight, I mean, I know you, your eyes do still travel, but it's almost instantaneous, right? It's much quicker, and, and because it's it's so precise, that it it doesn't doesn't fail. Yeah, I used uh, um, the Toby eye tracking. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that before, but I grabbed that. It's like this little bar that sits on top of sits on your computer. And um, it's one of the very first early eye tracking things. And so when you look, wherever you look, like the, it takes a little while for the cursor to catch up. And it gave me the most extraordinary eye fatigue. But like looking at this being, it was so instant and doesn't have to worry about whatever's tracking. I definitely wanted to play in that immediately. I, I spotted that Apple bought that eye tracking company like three years back. I was going, maybe this is the year that the Vision Pro will come out. It's taken a while to get to that point. Yeah. But yeah, I've been re like eye tracking. I think that's, like as I, I made a joke before about swipe to unlock, I think the eye tracking will be the big thing that everyone has to get used to, programming wise and UI, UX wise. Uh, one thing I've noticed um, playing with 3D stuff over the years is anything 3D is always harder than 2D. You know, a, a, a 3D model is harder than drawing just a, a, a 2D picture. A 3D movie is, you know, there's a, three or four examples of good 3D movies versus the hundreds of, of good 2D movies. Is is there something that's needed, and it, it might be that the Vision Pro is, is the thing that does it, that will actually allow you know everyday mortals to, to enter the 3d realm of actually being able to create these models i know the lidar on the phone sort of gets you part way there but is there, is there something that makes this truly easy to do and um can get you all of the way there uh, for 3d content for the creation of 3d assets uh, it's still as difficult as before I, I i think maybe with the uh the progress in like 3D scanning and and AI maybe we're we're about to have that a little bit easier. But if yeah, if you want a really good 3D model for your app, you, you just like you can find it online or you make it yourself. But it's I don't think it's easier. It's like easier to consume now with the headset, but for creation, I don't know. Maybe someone will come up with a really good like 3D sculpting app. Uh, maybe Apple Pencil. I don't know. Maybe. Well, Crossy Road was a literal reaction to that, trying to make the cheapest, easiest <laughs> 3D assets we possibly could. Everyone seemed fine with it, so that's good. Just, just from a like a not specific to 3D, but just as a difficult programming task point of view. I mean, anytime you're trying to attack something that like that, I, I'm probably in the same boat as you with like 3D assets and all of that kind of stuff. It's really just having a specific. Uh, it's sound really dumb given my app, the app that I make, but just have a specific project that you want to build, even if it's something really simple, and just attack that one problem and just try and solve that one thing. I think the sample project shows like a um, like a globe like a globe spinning and a satellite spinning around it, some of the sample code in the, the talks. Even just like try and build that, use their models and just try and build it from scratch. I think that'll get your head around the like the 3D maths and uh, all the new gesture recognizer, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's probably how I'm going to do it. So just some insight as to yeah, my approach. One thing I, I think I find interesting is we have a hard time sometimes explaining what a mobile designer does and why it's different to just general design or web design. And I think this is going to be another, um, le you know, another leap. Even the mobile designers are going to have to get their heads around what designing for this space means. And, uh, you know, their skill set's just going to start levelling up and levelling up, I guess, you know, when you talk about the difficulty of creating assets or designing for those spaces. They've, you know, I know there's some great content actually already on the developer the, the developer app, but I think, um, geez, if we were short of good mobile design, um, you know, curriculum for people to get into the industry, you know, we're going to have the same problem again with this, I think, even more. Um, one thing I did think about actually <laughs> was, as as an aside, was, you know how there was a point in time when iPads became cheap enough and kids started getting the hand-me-downs from their parents and all that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden, kids are touching your bloody TV like it should be a touch device. I wonder whether these glasses, eventually, it's going to be like kids are just going to be like gesturing like this and looking around thinking, why the hell is this thing, uh, is it not on? You know, like just that whole... Um, generation of kids that are looking at devices like this now maybe maybe at least they'll be forced to look at the screen at arm's length because of the you know vision OS will enforce that 
Yeah, probably. Yeah, we, yeah. we man our TVs really high to stop that, so you know. <laughs> Yep, turn my turn my iPad eleven into a thirteen. That was uh the the pinch and zoom, that was one of the first thing that we did, I think maybe after a couple of days of like trying to build an app on this. We had to find a way to like scale our models bigger, so like the the three D pinch basically. And like really naturally it came as a like as we call it the crab line because it makes you look like a crab when you do it just like pin pinch your fingers like this and just like stretch it and it works really and no explanation like needed for anyone who's trying the the app like no tutorial That's one of the big right. difference with having like uh, hand controls is if you if you've given vr demos uh in the past you always have to tell people how to use the controllers what button to press and they're wearing the headset so you like you're like touching their hands and stuff it's weird uh, but with with this, you can just tell them just like, just grab and like. It, imagine you have a line I between your hands and just like stretch it to make things bigger, and they just everyone gets it. It's really good. You look a little bit silly when you do it, but it's still become second nature. Yeah, 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 I think so. I don't know. It looks it looks really good. I think I saw like in the. I, I don't know. It's probably gonna be like one of those like really basic gesture that yep. everyone uses because it works so. So Ro nicely. Rotating and manipulating 3D objects has always been really difficult, though, in on a 2D screen. Like, you've always yeah. had to grab handles and you get th that gimbal in, lock thing. Where it In space with your hands, it's fine. Like, the what we did, so, like, for scale, we were just doing this. And for, uh, like, moving things, exactly like you would do on a screen, basically, panning w that you do with two fingers, we would do it with two hands. So, like, you, you do this, and you move your objects around. And rotating, you would just, same thing, like, you, you double pinch, and you... So, so it sounds like you're you're coming up with new conventions. I do wonder whether some of those gestures will end up becoming part of the operating system, because you're doing it on a per app basis. But you know, then what if the next three D app does it some other way? Then it'd be really discombobulating. Yeah, whatever. I guess like yeah, whatever ends up becoming the the easiest thing, the accepted standard, then everyone will follow. But I saw in the keynote that there's uh, there's someone just scaling a picture in with a gesture that's similar. So it looks like it's. I was disappointed they didn't have Tom Cruise at the keynote doing a bit of Minority <laughs> Report. <laughs> and actually, yeah, they could have had the the goggle thing like Iron yeah. Man. The another really good thing is that like they talk about it in the keynote, but the, um, because of the camera, uh, all the cameras are being like facing downwards. You it's you don't have to like reach out, and a lot of people just start by just doing this, like holding there, and that's really tiring, and you don't want to do that all day. But you can just like rest your hand on your lap and do like really really tiny tiny movement and it works perfectly so yeah, yeah. yeah. but maybe like for games and like different experiences you might want to just like be more swing your arms around but for working it's uh, like it's nintendo wii style yeah <laughs> <laughs> um we had some questions down there Bruno. Do you think we'll see an opportunity for three D Swift UI? I think it's it's already like that. I think, like you, um, there's a new type of view in uh, Swift UI. I think it's called a reality view, and it's just uh, it's it it responds to all the Swift UI components. Just normally, you can you can put them in lists and you can you can stack them and do everything. But it's for hosting three D content. So you can just make a if you wanted to have a, a scroll view like a an H stack with your with your things and have like some text some labels a three D model more images then you can you can do that it's just another component and I think they have a Z stack now a Z stack uh, so <laughs> <laughs> spend too much time yeah um, how long have you been in the U S for yeah <laughs> so you can uh, yeah so you can you can layer your your content in in in, in the Z axis as well. And I think some of their UI components have been made to be like in as volumes and not just flat, like the little toggles. Like you can see like the the indent and the shadow inside. It's all really nice. And when you gaze at them, like when you when your eye just starts tracking the one of the components, like they they pop out. But um, I don't know if they're gonna have like actual like floating buttons and things like that. I don't know. 
there's no plans to port reveal to the Vision OS to reveal 3D apps. Uh, Bruno? Uh, when the iPhone when the iPhone was announced, Steve said that it was basically five years ahead of the competition. What is your opinion? Where, how many years ahead of the competition is Vision Pro having used it? Uh, this is a hard question. I don't really know what's inside or anything and like what other companies are building, but it's compared to the other headsets, it's well, I, I don't know, it's like a whole a whole step ahead, I'd say. Like even the latest one that uh, Meta announced, it 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 didn't seem like that, that it was going to be as good as uh, as this one. And the no one has the the M2 and like the the, the custom chips that are made like specifically for the hardware, the software, all the the like the full integration. I don't know. It's gonna be hard for like if people want to catch up in that same category. Mm. That I think they're gonna like have a hard time. It's not quite the same though. I mean, w like with the iPhone, like not that there weren't mobile phones before, but they were terrible. Like the the gap between uh, uh, the <laughs> the iPhone and the Nokia's was like. Are these even the same object? Um, but I mean, VR has been, you know, all credit to 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 to, to Palmer and 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 Oculus and and Meta. Like they've definitely been, they've, they're, yeah, they've come a long yeah. way since that DK one. Like they've already broken a lot of ground. They just didn't go far enough, particularly with the notion of this is a computing platform and not a games platform. So, but. Yeah, it looks like the technologies that Apple have put together still, like, but there's a huge price gap there. There's a reason that Facebook or, or Oculus, I don't even know what to call them anymore. <laughs> the Quest, Facebook, yeah. the Quest is where it is because it is it is a lot less. Like I'm, I, I personally plan on getting both. Yeah, yeah, they are like very different devices. I think for different different use cases. I do wonder whether Apple obviously have got a massive patent you know, um, war chest as well. They've acquired companies and technologies. Not that they didn't have that for the iPhone, and we know that there was contention around the um, momentum scrolling, the bounce, you know, um, thing. That's why Android didn't have it for quite a while. Um, but I would expect that Apple are probably at least guarding themselves for the next five years before the, the competition all start looking exactly the same and have the, the bloody OLED eyes looking back at you. You know, it's... I mean, they they do it well, don't they? To 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 make something that looks that seems so obvious that in five years' time, pretty much all of them will look like that, you know. And they'll have the battery pack on the, uh, you know, on the outside. And we we'll go, yeah, of course it's like that, you know. Instead of going, oh, that's a bit crap. Yeah, they, Apple will have a patent on creepy eyes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a little question. Um, so, s s uh, Swift and Reality Kit, AR Kit versus Unity, and where would you draw the line? Well, I'm probably best poised to answer that. We, we are a Unity studio. Um, you, you, I mean, Unity's, you could see, I watched the the, talk, the WWDC talks today relating specifically to that, and it's all built on, you, you know, it, it, Unity is talking to, the, to those systems. The reason we do Unity and we'll continue to uni do Unity is we need to be a cross-platform studio. Like, we do need to support the Quest. We can't use, we can't, we just, we, we're too small to be able to write, we've got Swift apps over here and native Quest apps over here and whatever else comes along because I'm sure Google and now <laughs> will we'll do their announcement within six weeks. I don't know. But no, cross-platform is really important for us, but it is underlying using all those technologies, yep. Sorry, one more Vision Pro question. Just when you did the demo, what did you have access to? Like what apps were on when you get your half an hour just to play with it? Did you have access to working with a Mac laptop? Did you have access to Final Cut? Like um, we were using it to like to uh, port our app. So we, we had nothing. We just, we had the SDK uh, and well, yeah, everything else was Locked out, like we we I, I didn't use any of the, the the Apple native apps or anything. We just had like we had no home screen. It was just we had like a canvas. We could plug it into Xcode, just make an app. So yeah, I, I didn't see any of that any of that stuff. Yeah. Okay, another question, not mm -hmm. a Vision Pro question. Mm -hmm. So Quentin, you get a chance to have some input when. 
all of the new stuff comes out each year. How do you decide what to bring into your app, what to leave out, what, where do you sort of go as far as this is a really good product fit or not? It's all a good product fit. <laughs> I try everything. <laughs> no, I mean, there's some pretty obvious ones like, um, like obviously this year, um, there's health on iPad. I've got an iPad app. I use health on iPhone, so that's a pretty obvious one. So that's straight away. That's something I'm looking at. Um, just a anything that, I guess, any improvements to existing systems, um, and also just seeing other other opportunities. Like, will I deciding whether I'll deprecate an old iOS version as well and what implication that might have and what opportunities even from like a previous year that might um, open up because it is a good opportunity to I guess advance the whole um, app forward and yeah think about all those things and how they can come together like I mentioned before I've been working on app intents so I've had that implementation ready to go for six months but there's a real switch over to doing that from the old way of using shortcuts and there's implication like you can't support watch OS 6 and so you've got to get rid of that so things like that and then just so now it's it's an absolute no-brainer because that's what's needed to make interactive widgets as an example um, so I guess those questions get answered by how the whole platform um, comes along but also then <laughs> probably one of my other favorite announcements which is kind of a little bit dorky although I, w I wouldn't say that to the team that built it but is tip kit that was like really useful which is like most people would use that probably look at that as an afterthought but for me that solves a bunch of problems that I have non-elegant solutions to at the moment um, and and just watching the video for that um, just the way to actually implement it it's really it's really well thought out and just looks really good and it works on every single platform so again that's another no-brainer because that for me is something that will reduce, uh, reduce support queries and allow people to use all the features of the app that they haven't discovered otherwise so yeah just thinking about how it advances the whole thing yeah one of, one of the themes that kept cropping up obviously was around I won't say the AI word but the ML word um, so Apple like to use machine learning obviously all that happens on device and they're bringing that to a lot of the frameworks and capabilities that we can then use transformers now Tra what are they? transformers transformers okay Jeez. <laughs> not like to say ML <laughs> okay <laughs> um, but it, <laughs> it's it's interesting to see how you know Google have gone all in on on AI and what that means. And I guess before Dub Dub, I was wondering. Well, I was kind of thinking to myself: if Apple announced an AR VR goggle thing, it will kind of feel like they haven't read the room a little bit with the way a lot of the enthusiasm in the industry is headed at the moment, particularly around AI. Um, but it looks like they can kind of they're doing it their own way. They're combining that understanding of your habits and and you as a person the way you use your device and personalize the device to to bring the benefits of most of that stuff to the surface but i mean do you think there are limits to what apple can do compared to a, a company like google that's hoovering up gobs of data about people i mean they're just uh, sorry I thought, I thought you were <laughs> um, they're just different companies doing different things so it's i don't know if it's an equal comparison i don't know like I think Apple's a bit of a juggernaut that they can sort of make their own room. I don't know. Or well, they have, you know. I think both Google and Facebook Meta Oculus will have trouble in this space because of the lack of regard for privacy. And with a device like this, where you are wearing it everywhere you go, it's, you know, there's ca it's cameras on the front. Like, I don't necessarily trust Facebook with that level of personal information like i'm happy to use the quest as a this is a gaming device it's not really linked to my social profile i'm not going to get ads for you know the the stuff that i search for there's hiking equipment or you know i don't want i don't actually want that i would i want a barrier there and i trust apple to do that yeah that's right yeah i accidentally looked at the picture of the weightlifting kit too long and now oh my god the ads like if, uh, yeah it's I'm a little scared to let Facebook know what I'm looking at. Yeah. So that was one of the the things with the the privacy that's built into the the Vision Pro like you don't get access to where people are looking. You only get like the hit of the raycast when you actually look at something and pinch you s you see that but otherwise like the system reacts but it doesn't tell you. That was that was a little bit annoying to like you can't 
yeah, I think you can you can do you can project you have like the head position I think so you can cast like a little ray but you can never s tell exactly where you couldn't create at. a drawing program that that followed your eyes around for example because you're not going to get that yeah that data when, back. Like, when you think about it like even where you look and how long you you look at something that that tells so much about like what you're thinking about and how you it, it could be like used in a lot of really bad ways in various ways yeah to give you great ads I mean yeah. you you would <laughs> You would know better. I got the impression that it basically works kind of like the Apple TV does. When you look at something, it sets a focus state and then that item is focused. But then there's also a permission to get your hand movement data as well. So you can... Is that, does that sound right to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, the developer can request permission for hand movements. Um, yeah. But not eye tracking. Yeah, you don't even get the the hand tracking by default. Like it's uh, with those four states that you were describing. So if as you go deeper into the states, you have to request like more, more permission from the device yeah. like you get for your push notifications and stuff so as, as you dial the the immersion then you request like the uh the hand tracking and the scene understanding and everything i mean it could be good for you to the password as you type it in right yeah. <laughs> you, 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 they should people should not know what you're doing with yeah, your hands. No. and i think there was a thing as well with like the uh, accessing the like writing shaders and everything because your if you make an app you can't really have access to if you if you're in this mode where you can your app can uh, collaborate with other apps in the space when in this cube cube mode, uh, you don't have access to uh, the full screen to do like a like a post effect on the screen like for some some special effects because the screen is shared by other apps so like you can't have access to what's being rendered because you could you could have your banking app there and your game here. Right, right. And so, like, yeah. you can't, you can't have access to that. It's, so, there's, there's some tricks with Am this. I right? yeah, someone was saying to me, you can basically make your window wider, and then, so if your window's here, but your four windows there, you can, and then the person bunches your window, up, you can in effect have effects over other apps. I don't know how it protects against that kind of thing. Yeah, so overlapping over a transparent part of your app, kind of thing. Uh yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't really know how that works because, like, when yeah, when we're making our stuff, we only had the one app, so I, I didn't really try like multiple. And another privacy issue, I mean, obviously there's cameras everywhere. That camera is constantly looking into your space and your room, you know. A, a naked kid just ran through, <laughs> highly likely, <laughs> with anyone with little kids. But, um, like, you would imagine you, you can't get access to that at all. And I was surprised that Apple initially, like the first time I saw it, I went, oh, it's got cameras on it. I thought they wouldn't necessarily do that because of the issues that Google Glass had. And I'm like, well, I would imagine that, you know, you can't do pass-through without cameras, of course. But I think this is the stepping stone towards a device that literally it has no it's cameras glass, in it yeah. because it's literally a piece of glass in front of you and it's projecting the world and then it can do whatever it needs to do just with LiDAR. So I'd say that's hopefully eventually where we're going and cameras yeah. are removed from the equation at all because they're kind of creepy. Yeah. I, I didn't really consider this until you're saying that, but like maybe half of the keynote is pitched towards people who don't have one or will never have one, so they're reassured that the company producing these things with cameras on them aren't going to do anything nefarious. And that, I think that will... So if you see someone walking down the street with a Quest on, you'll be a bit cautious because you know they're, you're being recorded, but if you see someone with a Vision Pro, maybe like, well, they're not going to do anything bad with the data maybe i don't know <laughs> but theoretically like, uh, uh, it just occurs to me maybe that that is also just to they've reassure everybody else as well maybe so they bought a vision pro so they can't afford to have a family is that what you're saying like they're uh, more so about just like <laughs> more the, the, gl the whole glass whole thing you know being yes. seen in the street and people right. not being one of being wanted to be seen being by one, one of those people yeah or being on camera on someone's you don't know where yeah. it's going when you're being filmed yeah hey just one um last topic before we wrap up one thing that um, occurred to me was that a couple of years ago, Apple were really pushing the shared AR experience thing with the sort of Angry Birds with blocks kind of knocking over and you could play another person. As far as I understand, that functionality still share, exists share in AR kit. You mean share play? Or? Multi-peer, multi, oh, multi okay, peer, um, peer to peer sessions in yeah, AR kit. Like, so yeah. for you guys, like you'd want to be able to have multiple people standing around yeah, a table yeah. having the same experience. Is that going to be possible? Is it possible now? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. We actually had a lot of that, uh, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't shown in the keynote. But the the app that we made has a full like multiplayer support. And okay, it, it TC is just squirming in his seat. Then yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, 
<laughs> no, no, that's all. Good. Is that okay? No, it's just using sh- using SharePlay, like all the stuff that was uh, that was announced. It's the same SharePlay as uh, what you use on iPhone or iPad. So, you same yeah, yeah, yeah. D- just like the the stuff that you saw in the keynote with the person having a presentation and a, a, a FaceTime call on the side. So you could uh, you could do the same thing. So you can do like co co spatial experiences where. You so in this um, f- uh, fictitious household that owns multiple <laughs> devices at three thousand five hundred US dollars each, yeah, it's it's probably I think that's a feature for the future, <laughs> but it's good that it's supported now. They're all tailored to the individual, right? So I've got my little light shield and my lens prescription, and so what the hell? I'll just buy one for every member of the family instead of swapping those in and out every time, right? I think you have the they have the a profile I think with your because you need to when you wear it the first time you need to to set up your eye tracking just once so it, it remembers it but I think now they it they're goes more than that because uh, uh, with the, the the some of the previews I think it was Daring Fireball we we're talking about they they actually gave the glasses and then they scanned it to yeah. figure out what's the, what lens insert is going to yeah, go in like here that you can see yeah passing these devices around is going to be pretty hard I think yeah. yeah. The 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 glasses thing, the little lenses. So I don't know how you're gonna get them made in real life, but they they are like I've I've seen them. They're just like in the in the keynote, it's just like a little magnetic thing. You just it snaps on the thing. So if you were, yeah, I think okay, you get yeah. sized up for it. But it's yeah, th- w- I guess yeah. If you if you're passing it around, like when we were developing, we didn't have the the profile. The stuff so like if I was using it, it was calibrated for me. If I give it to someone else, then you have to. It's really hard because you have to like you looking at you have to look away where you think the other person would be looking, and it's really hard to pr- to like prevent yourself from looking at where you're. It was uh, an exercise, but yeah, like the saving the the user preferences that's going to make it really easy. Right. Well, I think that's probably about enough for tonight, Rob. Are we done for time? Yeah. Okay, well, um, that's it. Um, Join me in thanking uh, Matt, Quentin and Numa up here on stage for sharing some thoughts with you. All right, white screen. Here we go. Uh, ooh, that worked for a second. Now it's coming back. There we go. Um, just uh, lastly, want to thank our sponsors again, uh, Itty Bitty Apps uh, and Bill You for sponsoring the events and Coca Heads. Um, just a reminder that the next hack night, if you want to come along or even invite friends or if you've got somebody who's, um, you know, wanting to get into iOS development, get them along. Um, there's a whole bunch of people there that can help them out as well if they've got any issues. Um, Wednesday, 21st of June at Mantle Group, which is just in the same building here, but up on level two. And uh, next drinks night is on at uh, 27th of June at Penny Blue, I think it is. If you want to get along to that, share a drink. And uh, now we're going to head up to the Mitre Tavern if you'd like to conti- continue the discussion or maybe have a little bit more of a two, three, four way discussion about Dub Dub. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that want to have a chat about it. And there is pizza and stuff left to um, drinks. Yes, please pick up all the cans and other bits and pieces under your chairs and just chuck them in the bins as you make your way out. And thanks for coming.